Hello, everyone. It's 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. That's a different time zone for some of you elsewhere, but we are getting started. So I'd love to welcome you today to Animal Justice's Giving Tuesday Now live stream fundathon. I am Camille Labchuk. I'm the executive director of Animal Justice. And I'm an animal rights lawyer. Animal Justice is an animal law organization. So we try to use the law to help animals. And that sometimes takes the form of passing new laws that are better because Canada does have very outdated animal protection laws. Uh, sometimes that means going to court to fight on behalf of animals. Or sometimes that means just ensuring that the laws that do protect animals already are actually being enforced. And today, uh, we're, I'm just so excited that you're joining us for Giving Tuesday Now, which is a special global day of giving to help nonprofits like Animal Justice who have been hit by the pandemic. Um, I know we're all feeling the pain right now economically, um, but unfortunately, animal suffering doesn't stop during a pandemic. In fact, in many ways, it, it may be worse. So at Animal Justice, we're committed to continuing the work that we do to try to improve laws for animals in Canada. And uh, we had a, a goal of raising $5,000 today for Giving Tuesday, and you have blown us away. We've already met that goal. So we are, we're, we're now gonna take a leap of faith and extend that goal to $10,000, which is very exciting. And uh, another amazing aspect about this whole situation is that we've got a very generous donor who is offering to double donations received today. So if you are able to make a contribution, your donation will go twice as far which is very exciting. So we're gonna get started in a minute with a very special guest, um, but today we're asking for your support, but we're offering something to you as well. We're offering you this live stream fundathon to help support you and show our gratitude to you for everything that you do to help animals. Um, we rely on small donations from people like you to keep the doors open. And we're so grateful that despite the times that we're living in, you have been showing up to help out. Um, even if you can't donate today, if you're not in a position to do that, but you just want to listen, that's still a huge contribution because it will arm you with the knowledge you need to be a more effective animal advocate and help make change for animals. So we have a very exciting program just about to begin. Uh, we're going to start with Dr. Aisha Akhtar, a physician and public health expert who will speak with me about pandemics and their link to animal farming. And um, we'll hear next from Jeff Regeer, who is a former undercover investigator who has seen things on factory farms that uh, no animal should have to endure. And he's going to talk firsthand about what he's seen and why farms are the perfect breeding ground for pandemics. And then finally, I'm gonna be joined by my colleague, Caitlin Mitchell at Animal Justice, who is a fellow lawyer. And we're gonna give you a bit of a mini political advocacy training session to try to equip you with the tools you need to reach out to legislators. And if you're disturbed by the situation animals are facing and the fact that we're having pandemics, it will help you understand how to advocate for stronger laws and policies to prevent that in the future. Um, now, just before we get going, I wanted to quickly draw your attention to um, one thing. You're on our page right now, our live stream page. You can see a, a donation function before, which is where you can contribute. But you can also see a chat function where you can leave um, you can leave messages there for us. So you can ask us questions while we're having this, uh, this, this, this fundathon go on. And we will do our best to get to those questions at the end of each discussion. So if you have questions for Aisha, if you have questions for Jeff or me and Caitlin, we would love to hear from you. So if you're already tuned in, um, just leave me a comment to let me know that that's working because uh, I'm curious to know where everyone's from. So maybe leave me a comment to let me know that it's working and let us know where you're from. And again, just feel free to ask questions from uh, throughout because we want this to be a very interactive event. And if you want to, you can also click on the um, button that says user above the chat box and you can add a nickname for yourself so we know who you are. And you can also add a photo if you want to. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, bring Aisha into the meeting here. Hi, Aisha, and I'm not sure if you can hear me yet. I think uh, we just have to get your video on. There we go. There you go. Hey. Hi, Hi. welcome. Thank, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, so everyone, this is Dr. Aisha Akhtard, who I'm just delighted to have on. She's a friend of mine and one of the most impressive people working in the animal protection field. 
Uh, Dr. Akhtar is a double board certified neurologist and preventative medicine specialist with a background in public health. She is the CEO of the Center for Contemporary Sciences, which is pioneering the transition to replace the use of animals in experimentation with effective human-based technologies on, instead, and we'll hear more about that in a minute. And Dr. Actor is also the founder of, uh, the author of the recent book, Our Symphony with Animals on em Health, Empathy, and Our Shared Destiny. Combining medicine, social sciences, and stories, the book explores how deeply the well-being of humans and animals are intertwined. And that's one of the things we're gonna be hearing about today. She's also the author of Animals and Public Health, which argues for the need for medicinal and health institutions to include animals as part of the public in public health. Dr. Akhtar is a fellow of the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics, and she previously served as deputy director of the US Army Traumatic Brain Injury Program and commander in the US Public Health Service Commission Corps. Dr. Akhtar has appeared on numerous television shows and has been interviewed by national media. You can find her on Facebook at uh, Dr. Aisha Akhtar and visit her website at www.aishaaishaakhtar.com. So Dr. Akhtar, I'm so excited that you're here with us today. And before we get into the issues around pandemics and the way we treat animals and those connections, um, I just wanted to say congratulations on launching the Center for Contemporary Sciences, your new organization. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could just say a few words about what you plan to be doing with it. Sure. Um, first of all, I wanted for the center, I want to thank Nathan Herschler, who's the executive director of the New England Anti-Vivisection Society for um, starting the organization. He had the vision for this organization and he worked hard to get it established. Um, but uh, yeah, yesterday was my first day officially um, and with the organization. and. Basically, our, our goal is, is to get all animals out of laboratories and replace the use of animal experimentation with much more effective human-based methods in 30 years or sooner, if possible. Um, so our, we're going to be, uh, we're, we're a team of scientists. We're gonna be working with other scientists, with policymakers, with innovators, with business leaders, um, investors, funders, and you name it to really work together and create a really systemic shift in how medical research is conducted. Um, you know, one of the things about COVID that we're, we're seeing is obviously that normal isn't working, right? What we consider normal isn't working. We need a new normal in many ways. And that also includes biomedical research because we know that uh, more than nine out of 10 drugs and vaccines that are found safe and effective in animals end up being unsafe or ineffective in humans. And that's a huge dismal failure rate that costs a lot, a lot of lives. So our goal at the Center for Contemporary Sciences is to change that, to really just, as I said, get the animals out of the labs, get better technologies that are based on the biology of humans, not the biology of rats or dogs or monkeys, but human biology, and that will improve our ability and medical researchers' ability to find the best treatments to cure the ills that we face, including coronavirus. Well, thanks for that explanation. It's a really important piece of the puzzle that we're facing right now. And especially, I think we'll get into this later, but especially as we start to think about what comes next for tackling the coronavirus and how to develop a vaccine, I'm sure we'll circle back around to that. So anyone listening, visit contemporarysciences.org. Uh, today's Giving Tuesday, so I'm sure, Aisha, you would all appreciate donations as well for this new initiative, which has the real potential to make a huge impact for millions and millions of animals used in science every year. Um, okay, so Dr. Actor, you're an expert in public health and how human and animal health are interrelated. And you gave a very prescient TED Talk in 2015 that foreshadowed the pandemic that we're now in. And a lot of experts have been seeing something like this coming for many years. So I'm sure to you, it was no surprise, but you said at the time, it's just a matter of time before a new virus emerges that has the right combination to be both deadly and contagious. So it looks like we're now here. We're now in such a pandemic, one that's contagious enough to spread quickly and deadly enough uh, that it makes people sick enough that we've had to shut down the world to contain it. So as of today, we've had 62,000 cases in Canada 1.22 million cases in the United States where you're located. 
And it looks like the coronavirus responsible for the COVID-19 virus uh, seems to have emerged from a wet market in China, just like the 2003 SARS virus did. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about wet markets and what the conditions are like and why they end up being breeding grounds for viruses. Sure. So just to go back, we've we've seen about the estimate is that, is that we've seen about 70 new viruses emerge since the 1970s. And three fourths of these new viruses are coming from other animals. And it, the reason why that's a problem is that when you have a virus that can jump from species to species to species, it's a lot harder to contain. For example, the smallpox virus only is, um, it, it's, it's a human only virus. It's, it's only transmitted among humans. That's why it was one virus, the one virus, the only virus that we were able to eradicate. We can't do that with viruses that jump between different species and from other animals onto humans. So the SARS, this is why uh, the SARS virus and the, 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 from 2002 and the COVID-19 virus that we're facing today are very hard to deal with because they do jump from a lot of different animals onto humans. So what we suspect is the COVID-19, like the SARS virus back in 2002, emerged from these live markets in China. And that was, that's what epidemiological studies pointed to in 2002 with SARS, and that's where it's pointing to today. And it's, it's likely that the coronavirus originates in, in bats. They can carry a lot of viruses and not get sick from them. They're uh, natural hosts for a lot of different viruses. And because of the wet markets and the wildlife trade in general, you bring together bats with other animals like pangolins, in this case with COVID, or civet cats in the case of the SARS in 2002, and a lot of other animals together. You bring them together, animals which normally don't necessarily mingle, species which don't normally mingle, you bring them together into one area, into crowded, horribly cruel conditions. So these are animals that will be stacked into cages by the tens, the animals at the bottom of the cage often suffocate or are crushed to death. They are so miserable that on top of just being so crowded together, they're likely having their immune systems compromised because of being so stressed out, so miserable. And so it makes it so easy for them to catch infectious diseases from each other. So what we suspect is that a, at some point, either in the wildlife trade itself or at the wet, at these live markets, um, the virus passed from a bat onto another animal, like this, in this case, maybe pangolins, and then onto humans. So these live markets are terrible because they bring together so many different species in terribly cruel conditions. And they're, they're often slaughtered on site, which is unfortunately a very messy, messy um, situation. Um, and you bring in a lot of humans into the area. So it's a, a very, um, it's a, it's a very ripe breeding ground and a very right condition and situation for viruses to jump from one animal to an, another animal and on, ultimately onto humans. And so that seems to be where we are now. And um, wondering if you could just, you know, historically you mentioned uh, the fact that so many viruses have come from animals over time. I wonder if you could just delve into that a little bit more and and speak to some other viruses that we've experienced in other pandemics. And is it true that most of them have also been linked to the use of animals by humans? Yeah, I would say that most of, most of them, most of the new viruses that we're seeing have been linked to, have come from other animals. Now, whether they're linked to how we use them or how we encroach upon their natural habitats, there are a lot of different ways that we can catch these new viruses. But ultimately, I would say that the majority of these viruses that we are seeing link back to how we relate with all animals. And so, so I mentioned SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome. That was that emerged in China in 2002. There was MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which um, emerged in the Middle East in 2012. And that's a virus, again, that is, it's, it's, a fam it's a member of the coronavirus, like SARS and like COVID. Um, and we suspect that that one jumped from fruit bats to camels onto humans. That virus is still circulating and it has a, a mortality rate of 30 to 40%. So that's a far higher mortality rate than COVID is. And it is, it is a coronavirus. 
and it spread to 25 other countries. So it's out there. We're not free of that yet. And that could be the next problem. Um, there's also the Nipah virus, which emerged in Malaysia. And um, that came from, from bats most likely as well. And then jumped into pigs where um, the land was, um, uh, was cleared for pig farms. And, and I won't get into the whole story, but basically at some point the fruit bats were brought into contact with these pigs. And then the pigs, in the pigs, the virus jumped into humans. So that's the Nipah virus. And then we've also seen uh, bird flus and swine flus. In um, 1998, there was the H5N1, which is called a highly pathogenic avian influenza. It's a bird flu. And that was incredibly dead deadly. That came out from animal agriculture. And that had a mortality rate of 60%. So you think about it, right now we're, we're dealing with a, a virus that has a mortality rate that's maybe anywhere between two to 3%. And as bad as that is, it could be so much worse. So if we, if, if we had that avian influenza, and, and that's not gone either, so that could easily continue to spread. That's, that's still out there. We have a swine influenza, as we saw that in 2009 with H1N1. That was a new um, influenza virus that emerged from animal agriculture as well. Uh, and of course we have Ebola and HIV. These are viruses that we've been getting directly from the bushmeat trade or the killing and eating or other ways in which we um, encroach upon the habitats of non-human primates and chimpanzees. Wow, well, it seems remarkable. I mean, two things from what you said. First of all, it could be a lot worse. We're in a sense very lucky that the mortality rate for this virus isn't a lot higher than it is and, and more in the range of 30 to 40% like some of the other ones we're experiencing. Um, but the other thing that strikes me is how little we've had this conversation in the past decades that we've been dealing with these new and emerging viruses that thankfully haven't been as much of a threat as this one yet. Uh, but the, the extent to which the conversation has never really been about what we do to animals and whether that is something that we need to address if we want to ensure our own health as, we're, as well as their health. So, you know, to some extent, it's encouraging to hear discussion about closing down wet markets in China, although it seems that some of them are now reopening. Um, but you know, it, to the extent that the conversation is now being about our treatment of animals, it really has been focused on, on, um, on wet markets. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, on where the focus really needs to be. So I, I think in, in the West, it's easy for us to look at people in China and say, oh, that's what they do over there. Um, the way they treat animals is horrific. And there's all kinds of perceptions, of course, that uh, China treats animals a lot worse than North America, which I think if you look inside our factory farms, uh, some people will question whether that conclusion is true. But it's really easy for us to look in someone else's backyard and critique those practices and much more difficult to look into our backyard and uh, you know, acknowledge that we can find millions of animals in tight quarters on a vast scale. So is it fair to say that a virus like this could have just as easily emerged from a factory farm in North America as it did from a wet market in China? Yeah, and, and from factory farms, the real risk is the influenza virus. Um, and the, one of the worst pandemics in history is the 1918 influenza virus that killed, uh, I, I forget my numbers, but far more than what we're facing today. And the reason why, and, you know, most people think, oh, it's a flu virus, it's not a big deal. We get the flu each year and, you know, it's no big deal. We get the seasonal vaccine. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about an influenza virus that can cause pandemic. So there are three different types of influenza viruses. There's influenza C, which no one thinks about because it's not really a problem. Influenza B, which is the virus that causes the seasonal viruses we get each year. That changes just a little bit. So we're able to adapt the vaccines pretty quickly because there's just small change in the virus that occurs from season to season. And then there's influenza A. Influenza A viruses are the ones we worry about when we think about pandemics. And those are the viruses that are uh, mutating and spreading throughout factory farms throughout the globe. And we've seen in the past few decades, a real rise in the mutation rate of the influenza A virus. And that's coming directly from factory farms because um, birds, chickens, and turkeys can carry that influenza virus and so can pigs. And so you're, you've got conditions in these factory farms where these animals are crowded into miserable conditions and just like with the wet markets, 
they're miserable, their immune systems are down, it's easy for them to catch a virus from, from one, to catch a virus from each other and then spread it so quickly, even more quickly in factory farms than even in wet markets. And when you have a virus that can mingle between chickens and pigs and humans, it's really, this is how we got H5N1. This is how we're getting outbreaks of swine and bird flus in factory farms throughout the globe all the time. There are outbreaks all the time. And if you read the news, you'll hear about how factory farms had to kill or they decided to kill the, you know, this cold, these so-called coldies, this group of chickens because there's an outbreak of an avian influenza. So far, we've been incredibly lucky. So with H5N1, even though that was incredibly deadly, a 60% mortality rate, it was not, it ended up not being very infectious among humans. 2009 H1N1, the swine flu that emerged, was very infectious among humans, but it ended up not being very deadly for humans. So, but it's just a matter of time before a virus emerges from these factory farms, an influenza virus that could have the potential lethality of H5N1 that could be killing 60% of the people who get the infection and could spread as easily as, 2000, as the 2009 swine flu. So it's just a matter of time before we have the right virus that is both deadly and contagious among humans. We are not addressing that at all as our public health institutions are not addressing that, our governments are not addressing, addressing that. And I would say that in, in a large part, it's because they're big business. Yeah, they're big business and selling and growing and selling chickens and pigs especially is very, very profitable. Um, what struck me about what you just said is that the, there's been an increase in these incidences over the last 10 years. And it makes me think of uh, an increase in raising chickens and killing chickens in Canada. So unfortunately in Canada, and I believe the, the trend would hold true in the States, although I haven't looked at these numbers, but about five years ago, we were killing 750 million animals for food every year, land animals. And that number has gone up to 833 million in 2019. We just crack, uh, we just um, crunched those statistics from the government. And that increase is almost entirely due to more chickens being killed because the demand for their flesh is going up. So that makes me especially concerned given what you're saying about the fact that so many of these emerge from birds that we're doing this to an even greater extent. And, uh, you know, we're in a situation in Canada now, Are you, I'm not sure if you saw this today, but um, the pig farmers have been asking for half a, a billion dollar bailout package because slaughterhouses are being shut down and they can't get their, pro their product, um, i.e. sentient beings, killed fast enough. Uh, and the government did announce or $77 million today to help slaughterhouses keep workers safe so they can keep them open. Um, but missing in this whole conversation is any discussion, it seems to me, of the fact that these are industries asking for bailouts that could be responsible for future pandemics and are already responsible for other health effects. Why do you think it is that we don't hear governments, we don't hear the World Health Organization, we don't hear authorities incorporating, even the media, incorporating these questions into the narrative about pandemics? Because then they would have to take a look at their own habits and it's really hard to turn the mirror onto yourself. So most people in public health associations, they eat animals. And most people at the WHO probably eat animals. Most people in government eat, eat animals like most people in the world. And so we're asking people to take a look at their own behaviors as well. And that's really hard for most people to do. I will say that like in 2009, the American Public Health Association had come out with a, a paper that they published calling for a moratorium on new factory farms. Um, and it was, an, you know, they were saying, we need to stop the building of new factory farms until we study the public health implications. And they were also looking at the risk of new infectious diseases, but that didn't go anywhere at the time. And that's a real failure on the part of, of all of our public health institutions that they have not addressed this. Um, and there was something else that you mentioned that I, I was going to jump on, but I can't remember it now, but. That's all right, I'll pass for now. <laughs> Come back to it if you remember. Uh, but I have lots more questions for you. Um, you know, one of those questions is, is along the lines of what you were just talking about. What needs to change? What policy recommendations do you think that we need to implement as a society to tackle this issue and not, or not ever, but reduce the chance at least of going through another situation like the one we're in right now? 
Yeah, our, our public health associations and our public health agencies are really um, culprits in a sense. I mean, they're culpable in a sense that they're allowing and staying silent with, with these, um, the risk of pandemics from factory farms and from the larger wildlife trade. So it's not just the illegal part of the wildlife trade, right? A virus doesn't care how it's getting transmitted whether it's in an animal that's been caught in the exotic illegal wildlife trade or the legal part of it. So our, our governments and our public health agencies really need to take a harder look at this. Um, and how to get them to do this, I have no idea. I worked at the Food and Drug Administration, the Office of Counterterrorism and Emerging Threats where we dealt with, we were preparing for emerging, new emerging uh, viruses like this. And yet not once did we ever address the root cause, not once did we ever discuss the root cause. And that was incredibly frustrating for me. And so uh, I wish I had a good answer for you as to how to get our policymakers to address this. I, I will say that the one good thing that's come out is that I have seen some reports linking factory farming and the larger wildlife trade to the emergence of new viruses mostly in the UK, which I guess shouldn't surprise anyone, uh, hardly any in the US. And um, I don't know if, if any in Canada, but um, at least in the UK, they're starting to think about this. So maybe they'll take the leadership role here. Um, I do remember what I wanted to bring up. So with the coronavirus, with the, the, the factory, far with the factory workers and the slaughterhouse workers, particularly those who might be working in the factories, factory farms, who are, um, experiencing this high rate of infection with the coronavirus themselves. One of the big risks is that now they may transmit the virus to pigs and to chickens. And we don't know what, you know, how, how well the pigs and the chickens can be infected with these viruses, but if they can easily be infected, then it's going to be even harder for us to eradicate COVID-19 and even harder for us to come up with a vaccine that will be lasting because as long as the virus is mutating, just like the influenza virus, in these billions and billions of chickens and pigs throughout the world, and they could be mutating and being transmitted silently, meaning we don't know if you know, they're being carried by these animals, the viruses could still be mutating and mutating and mutate out of the vaccine basically so that they can be, um, so that the vaccine will no longer be, once we do have a vaccine, if and when we do, the vaccine may not be effective for very long if the coronavirus mutates. Yeah, yeah, no, that's an excellent point. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of time left and I've just looked at the questions and there's tons of questions for you. So I wanted to try to get to <laughs> okay. a couple before we wrap up. Uh, one question is one that I wanted to follow up on. Uh, so I'll ask you uh, this one. Uh, it's a question about antibiotics and other preventative medicine that's given to animals who are confined in factory farms. And I'm wondering if you can speak to the, the public health implications of the use of antibiotics on those farms. Sure. So globally, about 73% of the antibiotics produced are being fed to animals on factory farms. And most of them are what we uh, name, what we call medically important antibiotics, meaning they're antibiotics that we use to, for our problems. And so that's a huge problem. We know that antibiotic resistance is, is a huge problem. We know that it's in large part, what we're seeing now is the resistance is in large part because of uh, the use of antibiotics in factory farms. And factory farms won't exist without antibiotics because this is how they're keeping these animals alive because their conditions are just so miserable. So um, antibiotics are going to be a, a, a bigger threat in the coming future. Now I will say antibiotics don't fight off viruses, they fight off bacteria. But with more pandemics coming, and I guarantee we're gonna see more pandemics coming in the near future and the far future. The one of the big problems with a lot of these viruses and the way a lot of people get killed from these viruses is not from the virus itself, but from secondary bacterial infections that follow the virus. And that's where the antibiotics are crucial. And if we have bacterial infections, if we have bacteria that are resistant to these antibiotics, then we will see higher rates of people dying um, it, it, it indirectly from these viruses. Oh, thanks for clarifying that. I, I had questions about that myself when um, this uh, pandemic emerged and people seem to be conflating antibiotics and bacteria with the viruses, but 
my understanding now is it's a lot more complicated and there are relationships there between conditions that can develop based on bacteria and viruses. So that's, that's really good to know. Um, okay, so just the last question I have for you, Dr. Akhtar, is uh, we've talked about how governments are being slow to act. And later, uh, my colleague Caitlin and I are gonna talk about how to potentially speed that up by lobbying them. But I'm wondering if you have any words of advice for what we as individuals can do in the absence of government action. Are there individual actions that we can take? Yeah, I always tell people we don't have to wait for our governments to do the right thing because we're gonna be waiting for a long, long time if we do. So we each have the power in our own hands to really have a significant impact. And so really one crucial thing that each of us can do is just change the, the food that we put on our plates. It's as simple as that. And it truly is so simple. Change what we eat, cut out eating animals, cut, cut back or cut out altogether, which is even better, cut out eating animals, and we will each single-handedly help prevent the next pandemic. We will help reduce the impact of um, climate change on our planet. We will help reduce carbon emissions. We will reduce the poisoning of our air, our water, our land. And each of us will be um, far healthier for it. We will reduce our individual risk of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancers, strokes, and think of how many animals you will have saved in your lifetime as well. So just that one simple act can have such a significant app impact that can be widespread. Well, thank you. And that's an awesome reminder that, um, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure that's not the first time during this live stream will be interrupted by a cat or a dog or some other animal. Um, but sorry about that, everyone. Uh, but that's a good note to end on, I think, is the importance of taking individual action and not sitting around on our hands and hoping that some policymaker is going to uh, do that. It's up to each of us. So Dr. Akhtar, thank you so much for joining us for these really important teachings on the situation that we're in and how we can potentially get out of it. Uh, we wish you all the best with the Center for Contemporary Sciences. And just a reminder, everyone, since it's Giving Tuesday, you can go show them some support. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, so we have heard from Dr. Akhtar, that was awesome. Um, thanks to everybody who asked questions. We had a lot of them and I'm sorry we didn't get to more. I wasn't expecting so many questions, but you can follow her work and I'm sure there will be other opportunities for you to engage with Dr. Akhtar. Um, I wanted to give you a very quick update before we move on to our next guest, uh, Jeffrey Gear, former undercover investigator in factory farms and slaughterhouses. But quick update that we are now at uh, over $7,500, $7,500, which is so close to our $10,000 fundraising goal, which I'm just very, very grateful for. Uh, we all are here at Animal Justice and grateful for everyone that's contributing and trying to help the animals. Uh, so just a reminder that if you want to donate, you can do so right on the page where you're watching this right below and your donation is going to be doubled today by a generous donor. So it will go twice as far to help us keep the doors open during the pandemic. Uh, but more importantly, help motivate the policy changes that we've just heard we need to make. So I'm going to bring Jeff into the conversation now. Let's just wait here while he joins. Okay, Jeff, I think you just need to turn your video on. Hey. There we are, it worked, it worked. I'm always so happy every time one of these things works out, the technology scares me. <laughs> Welcome, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Uh, of course. Okay, so everyone, this is Jeff Regeer, and Jeff's a good friend of mine. He is a BC-based former undercover investigator and vegan and very longtime animal advocate. Uh, Jeff more recently has run TV outreach for animals, which involves him screening footage, um, often of investigations he's seen himself in a public place and speaking to people about what happens on modern farms in Canada and trying to motivate change. So Jeff, uh, I think probably few people have seen as much behind the closed doors of factory farms in Canada as you have, and we're grateful that you're here with us. Um, I wanted to mention to everyone as well, you just heard my do dog barking. You may hear, um, well, I'm not sure if you'll hear her so much as potentially see her, but Jeff has a very special chicken friend named Penny, 
who he rescued from um, a pile of feces and other muck inside an industrial egg barn. Uh, Penny, I think, usually spends her afternoons outside, but she may make a special appearance. So I'm going to cross my fingers that we get to see her. Well, um, I, don't, I don't know if now is a good time. She actually is inside the house right now. <gasps> I could show you right now. She, she'll probably head out soon, um, but she just, let's, you want to see her? Let's, let's see her. Let's see her. I think everyone wants to see Penny. Penny. Oh, there she is. Mm. Oh, what a sweetheart. Um, you know, Jeff, I, I wasn't planning to ask you this right off the bat, but since we are seeing Penny and she's in here hanging out with you, do you want to share the story of how Penny came to live with you? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, Penny was, uh, she's, if you can't tell. Oh, anyways, there she goes outside. Oh, <laughs> bye, Penny. She may be back. We'll see. Um, yeah, so Penny is a, an egg laying hen, so she's, uh, and she came from a, well, an industrial egg farm. And so myself and, and a few others went to, um, this, this egg farm just to, uh, document the conditions that the hens were living in. And when we, um, actually, no, that, that was other, sorry, that was another place. Um, uh, Penny did, was uh, she was found in the manure pit of an egg farm, uh, but unlike the other ones, it was still, all the other hens were still above in their cages, except for Penny, um, some, somehow or another, um, ended up down below in the manure pit. So obviously, um, no water, no food, um, just pretty, like, uh, pretty much waiting till she died of thirst and starvation. And so we scooped her up and took her to the vet. And she she looked she did not look like she, like she looks now. It's like she was, I mean, unrecognizable. Like she like it, most of her feathers were gone, just covered in uh, an excrement. Uh, couldn't really stand. Just really really weak. And uh, so we couldn't. Couldn't just leave her there, so we took her and um, brought her to the vet, and she was given all various meds, uh, vitamin, water, and anti antibiotics, and um, and she bounced right back. Um, she uh, like we couldn't bathe her straight away because she was she was that weak, um, and we didn't want to. The vet said, "No, you can't get her wet because um, she's just too weak, and just that bit of cold is not would not be." a good idea but uh over time yeah she just got better and better and she she stayed inside the house for the first i'm gonna say month and a half two months or so because she was in i'll say like the icu uh for chickens the rest of there are other chickens that they that lived outside um but penny was inside and then when she got stronger her feathers started growing back she went outside with the other hens um but unlike all the other hens that they just go into the shed at night um penny never or she just she didn't want to go in the in the shed and so she would always come around to the front of the house as soon as the sun goes down come around to the front of the house hop on that ledge that you just saw her jump out of and wait for wait for me to open the window and then she'll come inside and usually, like, usually the routine is like, uh, if I'm sitting here, maybe on the couch, she'll hang out for 45 minutes or so. And then she'll get up, walk through the kitchen, around the corner into my room. And she used to sleep on the bed, but now she's, she perches in the corner on top of the dresser. And so, yeah, yeah she sleeps there overnight. And then uh, in the morning when the sun comes up and it's light in the room, she launches off the dresser onto the bed and sits and will, she'll sit on me until I get up and um, and then she'll follow me out the door and then I'll, well, she'll follow me out the front door actually just because I have to go out and let the other chickens out and give them feed and stuff, so. Yeah. Well, that's 
a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing. Uh, what I love about that is it really describes what each farmed animal in Canada, and we kill hundreds of millions of them every year, uh, they could all be like Penny. They all have individual personalities and individual wants and needs. And because you rescued her, Jeff, she has the opportunity to show people who she really is. And it's heartbreaking to think of all the ones who don't have the opportunity. So um, if you actually want to learn more about Penny, you can check out Animal Justice's YouTube channel. Uh, we filmed a, a little bit of a mini documentary with Jeff and Penny about a year ago that uh, really describes her life and, and what life is like for egg laying hens confined in industrial barns. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I wanted to get into some, um, some, you know, some less happy topics and some heavier topics. We're, the, the point of the live stream today is to talk about the, the link between pandemics and animal agriculture and the other ways we use animals. And few people have seen more inside Canadian farms, Jeff, than you have. I'm wondering if you could ex describe to us a little bit uh, your experience as an undercover investigator and what you've seen, starting maybe with how you got into doing the work and the types of industries that you've worked in, if you can share that. Yeah. Um, so I got into it. Um, really, I was a, I was a baby, baby vegan activist. Like I'd been vegan for maybe a year or so and had just started getting into the activist scene. And uh, the group Liberation BC here in Vancouver, uh, they used to put on an annual event called Animal Advocacy Camp. And one of the uh, special guests that year was Twyla Francois, who at the time was the director of undercover investigations for MFA Canada. And she said, for whatever reason, she said, you know what, Jeff, I think you'd make a good undercover investigator. And I said, no, I, there's no, I can't do it. Uh, like I saw, like the reason I went vegan is because I saw footage, undercover footage, like uh, it was earthlings. And that was that was enough to wake me up. And uh, it was so shocking and so horrible to me. Uh, like I, I went vegan just on the spot. Just be, just because uh, it was so simple, but also um, I think I'm a pretty sensitive person. And like, no, I can't handle it. It was like earthlings tore me apart and to see it in person, no, I can't do it. Plus I thought, you know, I'd be terrible at it anyways. But she gave me a spiel about um, the enormous impact it would have. And so I still said no, but over the uh, few weeks uh, after that, I got more comfortable with the idea. And then I discovered that, you know, I think I do want to do uh, investigations. So, um, so I did. Uh, the industries that I've worked in, uh, like the dairy and uh, the yeah the dairy industry, uh, the egg and broiler industry. So also so on the egg farms, broiler farms, chicken catching, and also the uh, chicken slaughterhouse. And do you want to just kind of uh, me to go into what like what it's like? Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe I think our listeners would love to hear what a day in the life is like when you're on the job. What do you experience? What do you feel? What do you see? Um, it's, uh, it's tough, especially the start in particular. Um, it, uh, I mean, just physically, they're physically demanding jobs. You have to, you have to get up early and you're working long hours and just to do your regular job at the farm, but then you have your undercover investigation stuff that happens after you get off work from the from the farm or slaughterhouse. And at the start, um, the experience is what I think it's probably like for most people when they watch Earthlings or Dominion or any of these films, because at the start you're you're not desensitized to any of the any of what you're seeing, and it it hurts you the way it hurts to watch any, any kind of animal cruelty uh, footage. Um, and there, I mean, there is kind of a, in the moment, there's like a bit of a helplessness because you're seeing animals in front of you, like suffering and, and you can't just grab them and take them home. You can't, 
um, you can't just make it stop. You don't have that power, but you understand that um, exposing what's happening is, is the, the greater good, is what the most effective thing you can do uh, in that situation to reduce animal suffering. Um, so like, so I felt like on, uh, on the dairy farm, um, I was my, like the main job was hooking up milk machines. So they had, they would have like a, um, a 72 cow parlor. So it's basically a giant merry-go-round, um, that can hold 72 cows at a time. And you just, you just see the monotonous life of a cow, like their, their entire existence is every eight hours getting up from the pen that they're in, walking to the milking parlor, uh, getting, stepping on, getting milked, going around, and then walking back to the pen, like every, every eight hours for their entire life. Like, um, I like to get eight hours sleep, uh, and I can get eight, eight hours sleep because, uh, because, but for them, they don't, they will never get eight hours sleep st straight in their entire lives because that's their existence. Uh, every eight hours, uh, they're poked, prodded, co um, uh, to get them to the milking parlor and, uh, they're milked. And that, I mean, this is not even going into obviously as probably most of the viewers know, uh, dairy cows are forcibly impregnated. They have their babies taken away. Um, and obviously it sucks. Well, it sucks for all of them. Um, males are, are killed either on site immediately to go to the rendering plant, or maybe they're kept alive for a few weeks and then sold as veal. And you're talking about baby male cows who are born of female dairy cows. They're, they're sent to veal right away or killed yeah. for rendering. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, they, like they, they, I saw, um, like I was shocked at the, um, how common it was for like these cows to have uh, abscesses on their legs, just infected growths that are just oozing pus and blood. Uh, and that's because, I mean, they're living on concrete floors and they have, there's certain areas of their legs that are just basically skin. There's not muscle there, just a certain, you can probably picture where a cow's leg is skinny. And so it gets, um, it gets a nick. And then it's, if they're sitting, living in their own excrement, it gets infected very quickly. And these cows weren't getting treated um, because to treat them, to treat them, their infections would mean you'd have to take them off the milking line because you're not supposed to milk. You can't milk cows or can't use the milk from cows that are being treated with antibiotics. So there's this financial incentive uh, in the industry not to treat uh, sick animals. Obviously, uh, mastitis is also common, and um, these are both most of, most of the time they're various. Um, strains of Staphylococcus, which is in, in excrement. And, uh, and if they're sitting in their own excrement, it's not surprising that mastitis is so common. And for those cows, uh, their, their teeth will get plugged and the blood and pus and chunks of milk are just forced out. And you can tell it's, it's painful for the cows. They, they kick, they squirm, um, just like anybody would. If you're pulling and tugging on um, infected body parts, um, it's a horrifying, horrifying picture that you paint, Jeff. Um, and it reminds me, especially, well, I, I just can't help but think of the fact that because of supply chain disruptions, so many dairy farmers now are just dumping out that milk. Those cows suffered for milk that's going to be dumped out and milk that nobody needed in the first place. So it, it's heartbreaking. Um, but I also really wanted to ask you about, about chickens, um, not only because we just saw Penny and we've got tons of comments about Penny and how cute she is. So thanks everyone who, who, who thinks so. She is really cute, uh, very sweet bird, but chickens like Penny right now are confined all over the country in factory farms, whether they're confined in battery cages laying eggs or whether they're grown for, for meat, and those are called broiler chickens. I'm wondering if you could give us a little bit of a glimpse into what is what life is like 
for chickens. And the reason I'm so interested in chickens, uh, one reason is because we heard from Dr. Akhtar that uh, the bird flu, which emerges from confining chickens, is a huge public health threat. And the other reason is because we're killing more and more of them every year. As demand shifts away from red meat, people are eating more chickens, which is monumentally bad for them because they're smaller animals. So I'm wondering if you could give us a taste of what life is like for, for chickens. Yeah, um, if, you're, if you're on an egg farm, because obviously there's egg laying hens and then broiler hens, which are the meat birds, but on an egg farm, uh, overwhelming majority of ants, they live in battery cages. So it's like eight individuals stuffed into a cage the size of a filing cabinet drawer. And because we've selectively bred them to lay so many eggs, uh, instead of laying 12 eggs a year, between, they lay between three and 400 eggs a year. Obviously that's gonna take a toll on their body, but it also makes them uh, predisposed to other health conditions. And so, so many of them will die in excruciating ways. They'll, they'll have prolapses, which is their insides start, the reproductive organs start spilling out uh, of their back end, or they, they often are, become egg bound, which is uh, when an egg gets lodged in their oviduct uh, and they can't pass it. So these are just long drawn out excruciating ways to die that I can only imagine how awful it is. And this isn't like a, a once in a while this happens. Uh, every day you're pulling out dead birds from cages. And I mean, this something like this, this would apply to like well, any farm, even if it's the nicest free range uh, free range farm in the world, There's, these chickens are still um, subject to the cruelty that's, that's bred into them. Uh, obviously laying so many eggs, it makes it, they, they become calcium depleted and they're, they're really fragile. Uh, at the slaughterhouse, when you see them come in, um, broken bones, broken toes, uh, just because they're so roughly handled. Um, and because, yeah, because there's so many, uh, packed into, into, uh, I was going to say a small area, which it, so many packed into a small area, but so many in a, in a large barn, it's impossible to, to treat them. Never mind. Uh, it's impossible to notice them, notice the ones that are sick. If you, like, just imagine trying to inspect 30,000 chickens every day. It's just, you can't do it. And they, they just don't get veterinary care if they're, if they're sick, right? They're, they're either left to die or they're killed. Is that accurate? Yeah. The, the nicest thing that would happen to a sick bird uh, would be they'd have their neck snapped. That would be the nicest thing. Like, obviously they're not, they're not going to pay it. Like, this is another example of how financial incentives work against the well-being of the animal. Cause, uh, it, it just does not make financial sense to bring a, a chicken that um, has a monetary value of, I don't know, three, four dollars and to get a, like a $70 vet bill uh, or more, uh, it just does not, doesn't make any financial sense. So they're, so they're going to suffer and they do suffer. Um, it's, you can't even like, when, where I was working, you found uh, like rotting, decomposed birds in cages all the time, because just the job of even trying looking for the dead, uh, all the dead chickens, it's a big job, and you miss them. Uh, and so, uh, and so, like when I'd come in, I'd I'd fill in, I'd do like w work on the weekends for the main person, and every day I found rotten decomposing birds that the cage mates, they're forced to live, live with. They're sitting on laying eggs on and around the rotting corpse of one of their former cage mates. Um, and obviously- that's, that's horrifying, that's horrifying. And, and that's just egg laying hens. And, and of course, most of the chickens killed in Canada are killed for raised, born, raised and killed for meat. Can you speak a little bit more about broiler chickens and what they endure? What their lives yeah. are like? Yeah. Um, so broiler broiler hens they're obviously genetic, genetically selected to, for explosive growth, 
And so, um, like on average, uh, they'll be slaughtered at around 35 to 42 days old. So just imagine that like a little yellow fluffy chick um, just hatches from the shell and, and maybe 42 days later, at um, maximum of 42 days later, she's exploded into a full-size Costco rotisserie chicken. Um, and so this genetic selection uh, results in obviously they can't walk. They can't, they can hardly walk. And some of them can't walk at all and they're just crippled. Uh, and that's because their bodies are so overwhelmingly, you know, Frankenstein monstrous. Yeah, they can't, they can't keep up with the explosive growth of, especially like the breast tissue of, uh, that they develop. Um, and their inter internal organs can't keep up. Like, even if you were to um, rescue a broiler hen, uh, that hen's not going to live anywhere close to uh, the, the life, lifespan of a normal hen, of a wild hen, uh, just because they're, they're, not, they're not bred for their own interest, but for their own well-being. They're bred for, to exist for up to 42 days, and that's it. Um, you, if you've ever seen, uh, well, if, you, if you've ever been to like a, a vigil or anything and you've seen broiler chickens up close, you'll notice that you, you hear them peeping and you see this adult looking bird, um, but they don't cluck like, like we know chickens do. Um, they peep like a baby chick and that's because they are baby chicks. Um, they're baby chicks in these explode, like, yeah, these, uh, giant, these bodies that just do not match uh, their age. Um, and you see like their, their chest, their feathers haven't fully developed. Uh, their chests are always like red and that's because they sit in their own excrement. Those are ammonia burns. Like, and in, in the industry, they'll talk about how um, some of the, the nice things they do for the hens and they'll talk about the they'll put scratch down. So like a material for them to, the chickens to scratch in, um, cause that's one of their natural desires, something that they want to do. They have this, that instinct, but this, the material, at least where I was working, uh, it's, you'd think it maybe they put sawdust down or something like that, or make dirt. It's actually dried chicken feces. It's, chicken feces is saved and dried and used um, as, as the scratch material. Um, and obviously as, as time goes by, their, their own excrement is being added to it as well. Um, God, that's, that's so heartbreaking, Jeff, to hear that. And, and I just, I can't even imagine what it must've been like witnessing that firsthand because it's difficult enough to hear it from you and try to imagine what life must be like for those birds who are locked inside those barns right now. Um, we have a ton of questions. So I wanna just try to get to a couple, but first I wanted to ask you something really important. And one of the main reasons that I really wanted to chat with you today, and we might go a little over time just cause I think this is a really good conversation. Um, but I wanted to know a little bit about the conditions that you've seen on these farms. We've talked about animal cruelty. We know that farming is overwhelmingly horrific and abusive toward animals. And when undercover videos come out, they of course tend to emphasize the heartbreaking cruelty that the animals endure. But I know that there's always a lot of footage that never makes it, it into the view of the public. And oftentimes that footage exposes very serious biosecurity concerns and very serious cleanliness problems with these farms that uh, could be the types of things that contribute to the emergence of viral or bacterial um, diseases that can hurt humans. I'm wondering, Jeff, if you could describe a little bit about what you saw in that regard on Canadian farms. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I've only been thinking about this kind of thing more recently with uh, with Bill 156 in your province, Ontario, and obviously with COVID-19, this is this issue has been brought to light. Um, and, and just so anyone who's listening who doesn't know what Bill 156 is, that's an egg gag bill, uh, which is intended to shut down undercover investigations and whistleblower exposés into factory farms. It makes it an offense to get a position on a farm. Uh, with the intention of exposing hidden cruelty. Uh, so that's very, very dangerous. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that in the political advocacy training session, but um, just so everyone's clear on what that is, 
uh, <clears throat> one of the reasons that the government has been saying that they need a gig legislation is they're saying it's, it's actually about biosecurity and protecting um, animals from that type of uh, disease emergence. But Jeff, I think you have uh, a different experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, and obviously, if anyone's read read the proposed legislation, the primary yeah the primary justification, as you say, it's it's a biosecurity thing, and they're claiming that uh, that having that people going onto the farms uh, and documenting uh, the conditions that's the like that's a main biosecurity risk, where that I mean maybe maybe it is to a, a tiny degree maybe, but that is nothing close. To the the biosecurity risk that the industry poses to itself, like uh, at the at the egg farm I was working at, they they even they had this um, for some of the barns they have like a shower in shower out policy uh, to avoid any like cross contamination between the barns, and so you think oh wow hmm, they must be pretty good um, they're doing they're taking this seriously but at the same time they they use a uh, this like motorized plow to clear the manure from the barns, the accumulation uh, on a weekly basis. And that same plow is going from barn to barn to barn to barn, covered in an excrement, not sterilized, not cleaned, uh, no disinfection. And it's just moving, cross-contaminating excrement from barn to barn. So it's difficult to take the industry's concerns seriously given the, uh, the the breaches of security that they pose to the, their own industry, and I, I I think it's also interesting that they're proposing like uh, criminal convictions for somebody who uh, say an animal activist who doesn't live on a farm and enters and it obviously isn't carrying the excrement of five barns before them, uh, but it, it doesn't say anything about criminal conviction convictions for industry members who uh, breach these same biosecurity measures. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a very, very thinly veiled attempt at trying to justify the egg-egg measures, which we know, of course, are about one thing and one thing only, which is shutting down those videos of animals suffering on farms from emerging. Those videos are hurting the industry and the industry doesn't like them. It doesn't like when they get out and it doesn't like being seen negatively in the eyes of the public. So we know it's about one thing and um, one thing only, Jeff, and I, you know, I know from footage that that you've um, been involved with. Can you just speak a little? Because I think it's difficult to conceptualize unless people have actually seen this. But um, every time I see um, footage, and especially lately, there was a, a video in BC, of course, at um, a pig farm there, and then a video in Quebec at another pig farm. Um, it just astounded me the extent to which these animals are just living in their own excrement. They are covered in it. It is all over the place. I think when you see industry sanitized photos of farms, which is what the media tends to feature in their stories, um, or what you would see if you went to an industry website, people don't really appreciate the extent to which these farms are, are dirty. Um, can you describe what it's like to see that and, and what it's like to experience that? It, does it smell bad? Yeah, so it, like it's, it's normal to go into, I'd say a poultry barn, barn or a pig barn and uh, the air is just full of ammonia. Like it's, it makes your eyes water. Um, it's just that strong in the air. The fecal matter, uh, it dries and becomes airborne. It's just dust. It's dust. Yeah, dust, like fecal dust. And you cannot help but breathe it in. You can, even if you're wearing uh, a mask, it's getting in. And obviously it's, it's not, I mean, who, who wants that? But for someone who works there, they're there for, they're wearing a mask and they're there for eight hours of the day. These animals, they live in that. They don't take a breath of fresh air. Every breath they take is inhaling um, fecal dust. Um, yeah, I mean, and like especially chicken barns, uh, like the ventilate, like they're, they're closed because uh, they want to maintain a, a certain temperature. And so you can't have wide open barns with fresh air blowing through, uh, it's, it's all closed. And so that, uh, so it's dusty in there. Um, and, oh, and another thing that, that occurred to me 
that I didn't really think about until recently is uh, you get sick at these farms. Um, like when I, the first investigation, which was at the dairy farm uh, within the first week, I got sick and the people working, they never told, like the supervisors, owners, they never told me anything about this. Uh, level employees that work next to me, they told me that everybody gets sick. Any new employee comes, uh, it's just a matter of time. They get sick and at the dairy farm, they call it like cow flu. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Well, that matches what we know about zoonotic diseases, which are diseases that jump from animals to humans. Sometimes they're bacterial in nature, sometimes they're viral in nature, but um, that some people estimate, for instance, with the use of turtles in the exotic turtle pet trade, uh, that they carry diseases often that people mistake as a cold or flu and never even get diagnosed as having a zoonotic disease. So. You know, what we know about these facilities is that they're breeding grounds for viruses, for pandemics. And um, it sounds like your experience, Jeff, has borne that out. Um, you know, I'm, it, it's been really valuable to hear today uh, everything that you have witnessed working in these positions. Um, I wanted to just, you know, ask you one more question before we go. And I'm so sorry to everyone who asked questions that it's just we're, we're running out of time to ask them, but you've all made really good comments, um, including, uh, you know, people who, um, you know, one person commented that uh, they have birds and they take their birds to the vet at parakeets and they know how expensive that is. So of course, no farmer would ever bother doing that for chickens whose lives are just not economically valuable to them. Um, but one final thing I just wanted to ask you, Jeff, is I know that you've been seeing how many slaughter plants have closed down because their workers are infected with COVID. And I wanted to just shift gears for a moment um, away from the animals and toward another really important issue that is a problem with the farming system that we have right now, which is that the way it treats workers. Uh, you were a worker in factory farms. You were a worker in slaughterhouses. Um, do you have any insight into why it is that we're seeing such massive outbreaks in meat packing slaughter plants and what the experience is for those workers? Um, I'm not like a virologist, so I, um, but I can say like, it's filthy. Uh, like you, like you get like, at least I got um, animal excrement on my face all the time. And so it's not surprising that people will get sick. Um, you're working in close, close quarters with each other. Like, like, I don't know if, um, I don't think it's yet determined to what level, like which animals can carry uh, COVID-19 they all animals carry something, uh, but COVID-19 specifically, I'm not sure, I don't think we know for sure which animals can be carriers or not. Um, but even, even if they, they are not carrying uh, this virus, it's their, workers are working shoulder to shoulder. And uh, yeah, like, but it, it is kind of surprising, like why is it, uh, why is it slaughterhouses and not like, car manufacturing plants that are that are shutting down. I think pro it's probably closer, more like it's more confined. People are working in closer, closer quarters than probably other manufacturing facilities. I would say that probably the air quality, these people, the air quality is not as much worse than it would be in a car manufacturing plant. Uh, the work is grueling. It's tough work and you work um, long hours. Uh, if you, you're lucky if you if it's an eight hour shift because usually it's ten or twelve hours. Um, yeah, it's it's yeah. If anyone who the hours are terrible, um, the pay is terrible. Uh, it's it's nobody's dream job. It's it's people who don't have a, a, other opportunities, uh, who, who don't have another choice, who are taken advantage of and made to do this kind of work. Well, it's a great reminder that it's not just uh, animals who suffer in the modern food supply system, it's also humans who are forced to do that work. And um, I would just recommend anyone who hasn't seen it yet, the Globe and Mail did a really in-depth investigative piece on the outbreaks at the Cargill and JBS plants in Alberta. And I think what they found, Jeff, is largely along the lines of what you're saying. It's workers in close quarters. There are companies offering bonuses for people to come into work instead of missing shifts. Um, 
seems like there are allegations that management got protective gear way before the workers did. They're only now putting up or only recently putting up barriers between people. Um, and you know, the pace of the line speed is so quickly that it's very difficult to take a break and go and like blow your nose or sneeze away from everybody else. So um, Jeff, we really, really appreciate that you joined us today and the things that you've seen and the insight you have is really valuable, I think, to everybody tuning in. So thank you very much for uh, sharing your insight with us. And also for the work that you do, I don't know um, how you do it. I, I, I know I couldn't, I'm sure most people listening would agree, but it's um, of the utmost importance. So Jeff, we really appreciate that you could join us. All right, well, thanks for having me. All right, so, um, Thank you, Jeff. That was awesome. Um, you know, quick update. I just got word that we're at um, $8,046. So we're really close, less than $2,000 away from meeting our fundraising goal for Giving Tuesday Now. If you can donate, you can do that right here on the page that you're listening to us talk on. And your gift is going to be doubled today thanks to a generous donor. So it's gonna go twice as far towards addressing all these issues that Jeff just talked about, that Dr. Akhtar just talked about, and I'm going to add now to the conversation, my colleague, Caitlin Mitchell. Uh, Caitlin is also a lawyer with animal justice. And let's just see, I think Caitlin's just connecting her video and her audio. There she is, hi, hi Caitlin, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Welcome. So Caitlin and I are really excited for what's to come next because we've just been talking about the horrible situation on farms. Uh, and I just want to say thanks to everyone who's leaving comments. There's so many of you who have great comments and really appreciate what Jeff just shared. Um, but I think what we want to also make sure we focus on is not just describing to you what the problem is, because we all know the situation is bad. What we want to leave you with today on Giving Tuesday Now is also a solution. So what can you do instead of waiting around for governments and policymakers to come up with solutions? How can we make them? Come up with solutions? How can we prompt that uh, more quickly ourselves? Uh, so Caitlin, um, maybe you could just introduce yourself for everybody. I know you've, you're probably a lot of viewers are already familiar with Caitlin. She's been with Animal Justice for a while and you'll often see her name in emails, but uh, Caitlin, you have a background in the environmental movement as well. I do, yeah. So I uh, I just joined Animal Justice last year as a staff lawyer and I'm so excited to be able to to join the organization. Um, before that, I was a lawyer um, in the public interest environmental sector. So uh, I worked for a time at EcoJustice and at the Canadian Environmental Law Association, um, trying to use the law to protect the environment, um, protect the health of Canadians, and protect the health of animals across the country as well. Awesome. Okay, now here is the most technically complicated part of the presentation today. We're going to talk about political advocacy and why it matters. But before we do that, I'm going to have to figure out how to share with you the slideshow. So I did this successfully in a practice run, but I'm still nervous. Uh, but here we go. Here we go. Let's give this a shot. PowerPoint. Share. Okay, and I think it's working. Um, if you can see the PowerPoint, can you see it, Caitlin? I can. Okay, I think that means everybody can see it. So leave me a comment if you can see it just to make sure. Uh, or if you can't see it, leave a comment because that would be also helpful to know. But we're gonna talk to you today about why political advocacy matters and why it's one of our ways out of this situation. Uh, no one likes being on lockdown. No one likes animal suffering. No one likes pandemics there happens to be a common solution to a lot of these problems. And that solution involves going after the animal agriculture industries that are responsible for the situation. Uh, and the wildlife trade as well, and all areas where we're using animals in ways that are bad for them and bad for us. So we're gonna to talk to you about why political advocacy matters. And um, I'm just showing you this photo of our team. Uh, it's a, a few of the animal justice lawyers and the point I want to make with, uh, you know, with this image, it's we go to court, we fight for animals in court, but really what our laws are, are a reflection of our societal attitudes. And we can't win in court unless our societal attitudes push us into a realm where we've got better laws. That means we can't win without you because you are a society and the public is who politicians listen to. 
So that's really important. We can't pass better laws if the public is not on side and we can't win in court if the public is not on side. And I like to say that our laws reflect two things. And number one is public attitudes. So where people are and they're thinking about what's right and wrong in society. And I would say for animals, a lot of us are there. We believe very strongly, even if our actions are not always perfect, we believe very strongly that animals deserve protection. Um, but when it comes to the second factor, that's where we fail. And I'd say the second factor is the political power of a social movement and a group of people that wants to see certain laws. Uh, we're being outfought right now, outgunned by the meat and the dairy and the egg industries. All those industries that exploit animals, they're very, very good at what they do. They're very good at lobbying and they have a lot of money to spend on doing so. So we want to even that playing field for animals and we're gonna give you some tools on how to do that. So, um, Caitlin, do you wanna take this part? Absolutely. So. Um... This is a, a bit of a disturbing graph, unfortunately, and it goes to some of the numbers that Camille mentioned earlier. Um, we're seeing approximately 833 million land animals being slaughtered each year in Canada for food. Um, and to be clear, we're talking about land animals here. So these numbers don't even include uh, fish, for instance, um, that are also consumed for food regularly in Canada. And uh, of course, we've also spoken um, with our previous guests about the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the impacts that that is having on the agricultural industry. Um, we've started to see hundreds of pigs and piglets being killed on Canadian farms um, because slaughterhouses uh, across Canada and the United States uh, have been forced to temporarily close or to reduce capacity because of outbreaks of COVID-19 amongst workers. Um, the Cargill Slaughterhouse in Alberta, which is now the single largest site outbreak of COVID-19 in Canada, just opened this week um, against the pleas of union leaders. Um, and as Camille mentioned earlier, just today, we saw the Prime Minister um, make an announcement of $252 million in funding um, as just as an initial step to bailing out the agricultural sector. And $77 million of that um, is going to go to food processors, such as slaughterhouses and meat packers. Um, but of course, the vast majority of those companies are owned by multi-billion dollar uh, corporations. So there's a lot of uh, lobbying expertise um, and financial power there. Um, but to be clear, and, and this kind of goes to what Camille and Jeff were talking about, you know, it's important that workers have access to personal protective equipment um, and safe working environments that allow them to socially distance. Um, but what we don't want to see is federal funds being used to prop up an industry that's cruel to animals and cruel to workers um, and to allow the continuation of business as usual. We've also spoken a bit about egg gag laws, um, which are on the, this slide here. Um, and those are dangerous and unfortunately we're starting to see them emerge in Canada, which is still a relatively recent phenomenon and of course, um, as, as I think folks know now because we've been discussing them with the previous presenters, um, egg gag laws um, in part, um, what they do is they make it an offense to be a whistleblower on farms, so they, they make it an offense to enter um, agricultural property, so farms and slaughterhouses, with the intent of exposing abuse and, and shutting down those windows, shutting down whistleblowers um, would really, you know, close the curtain, so to speak, on, on Canadians' ability to see into these facilities and see the types of treatment that um, animals are experiencing. Yeah, so just, um, you know, to emphasize the point, we've got these industries demanding bailouts, we saw some governments today at the same time that these industries are asking for money, they are killing off animals who they can't use right now because the supply chain has been disrupted. And as Caitlin mentioned, uh, workers are having to go back despite the objections of unions to a potentially very unsafe situation. Um, now, just to, you know, I just want to include this slide because I think there is a, a really good quote on this. Um, the, the dairy lobby is one of the most powerful industries in Canada, and it's very emblematic of how these animal industries do lobby. Um, the former finance minister of Canada actually compared them to the famously uncompromising U.S. gun lobby. That's how sophisticated these guys are. And that's why we, and that's why you, 
need to up our game so we can compete with them because animals will never get the laws they deserve if these guys are able to spend big bucks on them. Okay, so we're gonna turn now to the legislative process and just explain to you and without spending too much time how laws and regulations actually get made. And then we're gonna talk after that about how you can get involved in that process and uh, develop relationships with policymakers. So um, Caitlin, I guess this is, this is uh, over to you. Great. Um, so what this slide shows is that in Canada, our federal and provincial governments have different areas of jurisdiction. Um, and the division of powers, as it's called, um, is set out in our constitution, which dates all the way back to the 1800s. Um, so when it comes to agriculture, which is something that we've been talking about a lot today, of course, um, it's important to keep in mind that both the federal and provincial governments have jurisdiction. So they can both pass laws having to do with agriculture. Um, but what you won't see on this list uh, is jurisdiction over animals writ large. Um, but you know that's due in part to the fact that back in 1867 and still today, uh, animals are considered property. And so uh, they fall under um, property in civil rights, which you see listed there as a provincial head of jurisdiction. And when it comes to passing new laws, uh, it's important to keep in mind that um, at the federal level, and of course you can see this lovely picture of Ottawa here, um, at the federal level, we have a minority liberal government, uh, which means that the governing party does need support from um, other MPs to push through its agenda and to get new laws passed. Um, Camille's gonna explain briefly how a bill becomes law um, and it's important to note, though, that um, new bills can originate either in the House of Commons, which is uh, what you see depicted there, or in the Senate. Um, but wherever they originate, the, the process for a new bill becoming law is quite similar. Yeah, so that's a great point. There, there's a couple ways bills get introduced. So a government bill is one that the government obviously puts forward. Uh, they do so based on their policy agenda and based on listening to Canadians and hearing what they want. And that can come either from, um, they can introduce it in the Senate or in the House of Commons, but usually it goes to the House of Commons. Uh, but then there's also private members bills, which are things that individual senators or individual members of parliament can introduce. They don't have to have broad government support. They uh, just need to be able to put it forward. And that's where we've seen a lot of progress on animal protection legislation in recent years is through government, sorry, private bills, not government bills. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the process for a bill becoming law, whether it's a government bill or a private bill, and how you can get engaged and make sure that that happens. So this slide, and I know it's probably not very easy to see this, so I'm going to take you through it. I think it's a little small on your screen because of the nature of this presentation. But generally, the bill has to go through two stages. It, if it's introduced in the House of Commons, it has to be passed there, and then it goes to the Senate, and it has to be passed there. And there's certain things that both of those chambers have to do, and they're, they're similar in nature. So let's just take an example of a bill that originates in the Senate, because historically in the last couple of years, we've had three bills that started in the Senate that just passed. And I'm going to use the example of the whale and dolphin bill, Bill S203, to illustrate some of what we're talking about. So uh, yeah, there's Bill S203 that was passed in response to um, horrible images and footages of, of the Vancouver Aquarium and Marineland. And when it passed, it meant that uh, no more whales and dolphins can be confined in Canada in the future, which is awesome. Um, so the first thing that happens is the bill gets introduced by its sponsor, a senator or a member of parliament. And it has its first reading and second reading. And these are fairly procedural. Um, you kind of, as a sponsor of a bill, you get on the, something called the order paper. So you can put the bill forward and then you're able to address it and say some words in the chamber. So just as an example, um, that's a really good opportunity sometimes for uh, very strong, awesome statements about animals. So this is a statement from Senator Wilfred Moore who put forward the whale bill. And I won't read the whole thing, but he says, Canada's federal law should recognize that whales and dolphins don't belong in swimming pools, they belong in the sea. I hope our chamber will lead the way on this issue by passing the bill. As the late Mahatma Gandhi said, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. So that's an opportunity to set the tone on the bill and have good debate. Um, other members of parliament or senators can also comment it on, on it at that stage. And so we'll talk later about when you're reaching out to politicians, 
uh, what you might want to ask them. But one thing you might want to ask them is to participate in uh, the debate early on on these bills. So the first reading is pretty pro forma. Second reading, there is some debate. And at the end of second reading, there is a vote to decide if a bill goes to a committee, which is the next step. So the committee stage. Committee stage is important because that's where the bill gets studied. And that's where uh, parliamentarians can hear from experts. So I testified, for instance, um, on a couple bills this year, but one of them was the bill that eventually outlawed animal sexual abuse and uh, animal fighting, uh, closed some loopholes in animal fighting. So people can show up there and testify. If you have expertise, you can potentially testify if you get the committee to accept you as a witness. There's ways to apply publicly on the, the parliamentary website. So the committee hears from experts and they make some recommendations about whether the bill is good to go as it is, or if there's some amendments that could make it stronger or better. Then um, I wanna use for you an example of the whale bill, um, how advocates made a difference at the committee stage. So because the committee stage is so important uh, and because members are considering potentially making amendments, there's also the opportunity for things to go south. And in this case of the whale bill, some senators on that committee that were studying it wanted to kill the bill. They did not want to see it move forward. So they tried to kill it behind closed doors. We caught wind of this, the animal advocacy community pulled together and we mobilized people. And because of probably many of you listening today, a wave of support for the bill swamped the Senate email server. It literally shut down email in the Senate because so many emails were coming in saying, do not kill this bill. So you saved the day. And that's a great example of ways that we can all get involved in this process. Um, another time, uh, you know, another time that uh, you saved the day is when this whole process happened. Um, finally, the Senate voted on the bill. It, it got into the House of Commons because it passed through the, the Senate procedures. And then it repeated that in the House of Commons and things were going very well until again, it got to the committee, which is like the second last stage of passing the bill. And again, it seemed that some senators or some members of parliament this time wanted to amend the bill, which would have meant the amendments weren't bad themselves, but because the bill would have run out of time to pass before the election, if there were changes, it was a bad thing. Um, so we once again, mobilized supporters. Uh, we didn't think the bill was going to pass. We thought that this was a march to its death. Uh, but because so many of you, again, wrote to MPs and said, do not kill this legislation they were forced to listen. So you have real power, people have real power because politicians don't want to lose support, they don't wanna lose the next election. And if they fear that they will, they will do what we want. So that's what we have to keep in mind is using the power that we have. Um, so in that case, the free willy bill as it was known was actually sent to the House of Commons for a final vote. Uh, and then it had that final vote at what's called third reading and then it became law. So that was a success story. Uh, okay, so that's generally the legislative process in um, in Ottawa in Parliament, and we're going to turn it now um, just to describing a little bit about what legislation is um, versus regulation, because that's important too. So oftentimes people hear about regulations about things and, and legislation, and there's a difference between the two of them, which we want to explain. So legislation is a statute. That's a law. It's an act that passes uh, through Parliament that says you know, here's um, a law about X topic. But a regulation is a little bit different. It's subservient to the legislation. So it's rules that can be made under the legislation, but the regulations don't necessarily have to go back to parliament and be passed again. They can often be written by the bureaucracy and then approved by cabinet. So just to give you an example, um, in Canada, we talk a lot of animal justice about that, how there aren't any laws regulating farming in this country. And some of the information you've heard from Jeff, I'm sure that doesn't surprise you because what he witnessed would be a criminal offense if it was done to a cat or a dog. But because there are no laws regulating farming in this country, um, farms tend to get away with egregious cruelty. But the two areas where there are laws involve animal transport and animal slaughter. So the Health of Animals Act regulates animal transport. Um, so it's a broad statute, but underneath it are the Health of Animals regulations. And that's where we see the rules about transporting animals. Uh, for instance, chickens uh, are subject to that. And chickens are a good example of the might of the animal 
agriculture lobbying industry. So the, the animal transport regulations, as some of you might know, were actually amended recently after over 40 years of organizations pushing for change. And we were really hoping that they would be much stronger because currently, well, previously they were very weak. They allowed for transport for days at a time. Um, I'm showing this chicken because this is an example of um, a spent hen. So Jeff spoke about hens on industrial farms and what they endure. At the end of their lives, after their bodies are depleted and they've laid as many eggs as they can and they're no longer profitable, they're sent to slaughter on trucks and crates like this. And they're very vulnerable because uh, they're in very poor condition health-wise and because the conditions of transport are also horrific. Animals can be transported in freezing cold and boiling hot temperatures. So the evidence that the government was considering in amending the transport laws showed that hens suffered after about 12 hours. So when it initially proposed making amendments, it suggested 12 hours would be the maximum time that anyone can transport a hen. Well, the industry didn't like that very much. Uh, we got freedom of information documents back from the government that showed that in response to the industry complaining and lobbying them, they adjusted that 12 hours up to 24 hours. So hens can be transported for twice as long as the science shows that they're suffering. So just an example of legislation or regulation and how the industry was able to get in there and influence that and how we need to do the same. Um, and just one final thing to talk about, there's legislation, there's regulation, but there's also something else called policies, government policy. Uh, the Canada Food Guide is a really good example of something that's not legislation or regulation, but it is a policy and it makes a difference for animals. So as a lot of you know, uh, the Canada Food Guide was revised last year, it came out um, suggesting that there is no longer a dairy category and that people should eat mostly plant-based protein. So it really de-emphasized the importance of eating animal foods. And that was a tremendous policy change. The government didn't have to pass a law to do this. This is just a document that they create that says, here's Government of Canada policy on the food guide. This is what people should be eating and how they should do it. And uh, it came out with a really good result. And one of the reasons it was so good is because Health Canada, which was in charge of doing this, didn't accept lobby meetings from the industry. They said industry can go to the regular consultation channels and they're gonna look at the science. So it just goes to show what happens when we get industry out of the equation and uh, level off the playing field a little bit. There's huge power of what can be done. Uh, dairy farmers were really unhappy about this, which was great. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back to Caitlin now, and she's going to talk a little bit about um, provinces. We've heard about the federal government. Now we're going to shift gears to provinces. Thanks, Camille. So, yeah, we've heard a lot um, about what's going on uh, at the federal level. Of course, there's lots going on there. But of course, you know, there's a lot of really important stuff happening provincially, too. Um, and the main thing that we've heard about today is this new trend of egg gag laws in Canada. We saw Alberta pass the first egg gag law in the country, um, and Ontario is now ready to follow suit, it seems. Um, we showed you the breakdown of seats federally um, in Ontario, just by way of an example, um, there is a majority government, which means that the ruling party uh, is generally going to be able to pass new legislation despite concerns from opposition. So it can make things a little bit harder when, for instance, uh, you're out there trying to stop the passage of Bill 156, at least um, in its current form. And, and certainly that's something that we've been spending a lot of time on at Animal Justice. Um, so the legislative process in Ontario, though, is, is similar uh, in most ways to the process federally, um, which Camille has already gone through. Um, but before things shut down in March, Bill 156 had made it past second reading and was heading to the committee stage. It was going to go to the general government committee um, at the end of March. Um, and it's really at that stage that the committee would hear from members of the public who are either supportive of the bill or quite concerned about it, as I think uh, many people uh, tuning in today probably are. Um, and the committee was going to hold public hearings and also allow individuals and groups to submit written comments. So we don't know exactly when that uh, process is going to start up again, but it seems likely that uh, it'll be sometime in the fall. So that'll be a really important opportunity for people across Ontario to weigh in on this bill. Um, and hopefully we can get uh, at least some 
really significant amendments to the bill before it goes back to the assembly for third reading. Absolutely, because what we're seeing with AGAG, obviously we're concerned about the animal cruelty that's going to be hidden with it, but we're also concerned that it will hide biosecurity concerns. It will hide some of the filthy conditions that Jeff described that will make it more likely that farms can make us sick. And so we think it's all the more important that this legislation be shut down. Uh, so finally, there's one more level of government and that's municipalities. Um, we're, I'm in Toronto, so I'm using the example of Toronto, but municipalities across the country have uh, often pretty sweeping authorities to do things respecting animals. It really varies, so it's difficult to say with any certainty what your jurisdiction can do. But in Ontario, at least, which is the biggest province, um, municipal governments can ban wildlife. Uh, aspects so exotic wildlife so most I shouldn't say most but a lot of most of the major cities in Ontario do have bans already on many types of exotic animals uh, the province is considering bringing in legislation as well and we'll you know be sure to alert you how you can get involved with that if you're on our email list but uh, when we're talking about shutting down the exotic wildlife trade that's something that we can ask municipalities to do too we can ask them to ban wildlife sales in the city. We can ask them to ban ownership of all types of exotic animals and, and just let people have domestic pets who uh, don't transmit diseases in the same way. Um, in Toronto, there are 26 councillors. That's uh, you know high compared to a lot of other cities. Uh, the point here is that unlike Ottawa where you've got 338 MPs who you need to get on board to do something, or Queen's Park or another legislature where there's um, you know, over 50, maybe up to 100 and some legislators to, to convince, uh, it can be a lot easier to convince 26 councillors or in some places where the numbers are even smaller, more like, more like 10 councillors. It can be easy to meet with all those people and convince them of why something needs to change for animals. So don't, don't write off the municipal level because that's often a place where great changes can be made. And municipalities can often lead the change. So for instance, when we saw shark fin being banned across the country and last year, Ottawa finally banned imports into Canada, which was incredible. But the very first jurisdiction to ban shark fin sales was Brantford, Ontario. And that led to Oakville, Toronto, I think Mississauga, other locations banning it as well. And then that crept up to the federal level eventually. So oftentimes it's, it's great to work on municipal issues. All right, now we're going to shift gears and uh, get into the final segment. And I, I have just checked the questions box. So many of you have great questions and comments. We are going to get to them at the end. But we want to talk now about building productive relationships with policymakers. So we've talked about the legislative process and how we do that. Now we're going to discuss what you can do as an individual to get a meeting and what you say in a meeting, because it's overwhelming for people if you haven't done it before. But once you get started, you'll find it's not so bad. Um, okay, so what we want to see the animal community doing is building productive relationships with local representatives. So that includes federal, that includes provincial, that includes city councillors. And the way you build a relationship with them in many respects, it's like the way you build a relationship with anybody else, like a business relationship or a professional relationship. Um, you have to invest time in it and you have to consistently show up. So we're gonna go through a few different examples of ways to do that. Um, but emailing them, phoning them, sitting down face to face with them, attending events where your representative is going to be speaking and just reminding them that you're there and that you care about these issues. This is all incredibly, incredibly important stuff. Um, they need to know that there's a critical mass of people out there like you who are reasonable, normal people who just want to see policy change for animals uh, to prevent them from suffering and to prevent pandemics. And the more you put yourself in front of them, the more you remind them that you are out there, the more of a difference that makes. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of a friend of mine, Kayla and I had a meeting with a, a member of provincial parliament before the pandemic shut everything down. And um, he brought up a friend of mine who lives in the same riding as me. And he said, oh yeah, I know her, she's great. She emails me all the time about these things. And he knew about the issues that we came in to speak with him about because she was there reminding him that that was important to her. Uh, and that's what their job is, is to listen to constituents. When enough constituents phone or email or ask for meetings about something, they know that's important enough that they have to respond to that. Um, but, you know, beyond just 
building a relationship. You can get involved in other ways, like joining a political party to support animal friendly policies or leadership candidates. If somebody really strong was running, who's got a very good track record, you could do that. Um, supporting them during elections and volunteering for, for them or in MPs or their constituency offices as well. Okay, so first off, how do you find out who your MP is? That's a pretty basic question and it's the first thing you've got to figure out. It's um, quite easy. Now this slide might be a little small and I apologies, I can't really expand it, but um, what you need to do is just visit ourcommons.ca, which is the federal parliament's website and um, go on there and you can look at the members section and then you can put your postal code in and it will show you exactly who your MP is. So that's how you find them. There's a similar process for your MLA or your member of provincial parliament or your city councilor. Just poke around those websites and usually you can find the person pretty easily. Find the name of your writing, use your postal code, and there you go. You also might wanna find out how they voted on animal protection issues in the past. And this is not difficult either. So you can find this out federally using a website called Legisinfo. Um, it's part of the parliamentary website family. But if you visit this website, um, just Google Legis Info. That's probably the easiest way to take notes rather than writing the whole thing down, but it's L-E-G-I-S-I-N-F-O. You can look up individual bills that protected animals and see how your member of parliament voted on that bill. Um, so to do that, and I apologize, this is probably pretty small, but we're using the example of bill C-246 which was a general animal cruelty bill put forward by uh, MP Nathaniel Erskine Smith in Toronto, who's a huge champion for animals. And his bill unfortunately did not pass. Um, a lot of people voted against it, including members of his own party. And you can see exactly who those people are by looking at the vote on attached to the page on Legisinfo. It'll show all the names of members of parliament and exactly how they voted if you scroll down on that page. So that's how you can find out what your MP's track record is. Um, not all bills have recorded votes. Sometimes they're voice votes if there's general agreement that they should pass, or if a party doesn't want to be recorded voting against something, even if they kind of don't really support it, then they might just go to a voice vote, in which case you won't have um, a, a data point here to look at. Okay, so how to get a meeting. Um, it's It can be surprisingly easy, actually. Uh, intimidating if you don't know how, but all you do is you phone or email your, the constituency office of your member of parliament or other representative. And you're gonna be speaking first with their staff. It'd be pretty rare that an MP themselves would answer the phone, um, but you want to phone their constituency staff. And I say constituency office because there's two different offices that they usually have. There's one in Ottawa in parliament, and there's one in the riding that they actually represent. So if you live in the riding, you wanna meet them in the riding. And usually they're home on the weekends or during parliamentary breaks or on holidays. So once you phone and, and talk to their staff, you'll explain first who you are, what you wanna meet about, the fact that you're a constituent, and then you'll ask for a meeting when they're next home in their riding. So usually during a week when parliament or the legislature isn't sitting. When you get to the meeting, um, I'm gonna turn this over to Caitlin to just describe a little bit about how you can be effective inside meetings. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as it says on this slide, I think one of the most important things you can do is, is really prepare in advance for this type of meeting and come with you know, one or two issues that you want to discuss um, and really spend some time educating yourself about those issues. You want to um, present yourself as a subject matter expert um, or you know, to at least enlist the services of subject matter experts. We get emails from people all the time um, who are you know, gonna meet with politicians and, and ask us if there's anything we should bring up. And um, oftentimes we have background documents, for instance, that we can share and I'm sure other groups are the same. Um, so you can use those to inform yourself or even to bring them to the meeting with you. Um, so you want to make sure that you are prepared, you have your areas of focus, um, and then you can really uh, you know, go in and, and ask your representative to support your issue. You can have any range of asks, and, and Camille has a few on the agenda, whether that's for them to propose legislation, for them to support legislation that's already being proposed. Um, whatever, whatever it is that you're there, just be clear what your ask is um, and then follow up 
that's another important task, you know, follow up on the meeting um, and keep talking to them about these issues, keep them front and center as much as you possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really a big part of an ongoing relationship is the follow up. Um, it's great to go in there. It's great to get a meeting. But if that's all that happens, then you're missing an opportunity to keep that relationship going. Um, ultimately, when politicians see that the people who are asking them for things are reasonable, they're people that they like, they're people that they want to help, uh, they will often try to help you. Uh, even if they can't do everything that you want them to do, they might be able to give you some suggestions or talk to colleagues who can. So that follow-up part is very, very important. And um, just, you know, we're, we're getting close to wrapping this up and then we're going to get in, into some questions, but just a few words about your approach when you go into these meetings. Um, it's always important, obviously, in any interaction like this to be very polite and courteous. You want to be friendly to this person. You want to develop a relationship and start that off on the right foot. Uh, even if you know that your politician that you're meeting with has supported um, animal industries in the past, it's good to avoid being judgmental. They may have family members involved in industries. They may have just been lobbied more by the other side. Um, everybody is a potential ally, but if you approach that meeting with judgment and with your backup already, then you're missing an opportunity to really educate them and connect with them and maybe get them onto your side. And connecting with them is important. Creating genuine connections is important. Uh, you wanna understand what motivates that decision maker. So what is their riding like? Who do they represent? Do they have a lot of dairy farmers in their riding? Are they representing an urban riding where people care a lot more about these concerns? Um, is there a Humane Society or SPCA in their riding? Um, have they lost a lot of constituents, unfortunately, to the COVID crisis? Uh, would they be open to understanding some of the root causes and addressing them? So you want to understand what motivates that person. Really ask questions with a, with a view to listening to the answers, um, to try to understand them better and understand their concerns better. Because if you can understand what their concerns are, you can help address those concerns with more information. And you want to find common ground, um, find hobbies that you have in common with that person. Um, you know, there's, we all share many aspects in common with each other, even if we have differences and somebody that you might not expect to get along with um, often might be that person. I, you know, there, there are a number of members of parliament who are hunters and fishers who, despite doing activities that I personally don't engage in or like, I uh, can be quite jovial and fun and friendly and often very supportive on different things. So you always want to approach those meetings thinking that this person could be a potential ally. And uh, Caitlin, do you want to just make this last point about supporting them when they do good work? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, this is an important point, not just for individuals, but also for animal protection groups or other uh, not-for-profit groups that are working to create change. Um, it's easy to come out in force when we see governments do bad things, things that we do not like. Um, and it's easy to be there to try to push them to do things that we want them to do. But what I think is really important is that if and when they do those good things that we're there to really celebrate those successes um, and to help them to see that that doing those things are, are not only the right thing to do, but also good for them politically. They're popular moves. Canadians like them, constituents like them, um, and groups like us will be there to, to draw attention to that good work if and when it happens. Critically, critically important. So that we've given you a very brief version of political advocacy training. We do we did a much longer seminar last fall. It was several hours long, and we're actually working on um, a module or a bunch of modules on this stuff and many other ways that people can be more effective activists that we'll be releasing in the fall. So this is a little sneak preview, but please stay tuned for something much bigger that will help you uh, gain even more skills in this arena. But I wanted to just uh, thank you for listening to this. I'm going to stop sharing this PowerPoint. I think that worked. And did that work, Caitlin, is it gone? I don't see it, so hopefully not. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. good. so that, well, that was really, um, I hope that was useful. And now we have a ton of questions. So I thought before we wrap this up, Caitlin, I'll, I'll just go through some of the questions and we can try to, to um, respond to them. Sounds so good. one person is asking, what's the most pertinent issue that I can bring up to my MP right now? I mean, that's, that's a tough one because there's a lot going on. Um, I think one of the contexts that we're struggling with right now as an advocacy group here at Animal Justice and the broader animal protection community is that 
the government's very, very busy and rightfully so dealing with the crisis. They don't have a lot of bandwidth for other issues right now. So I think what um, we have tried to do is be very responsive to animal issues as they arise during the crisis. And one thing, um, Caitlin, maybe you want to talk about what you've been working on recently, which is encouraging the government to subsidize the right kinds of industries. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think with this kind of work, it's important to be nimble and to be able to respond as new things come up. So, you know, if, if you had asked this question, say, two months ago, our, our answer would be quite different. But now we find ourselves in the midst of a pandemic. So something that we've been really focusing on lately um, is, you know, seeing that the animal agriculture industry is asking for hundreds of million dollars in bailout funds and trying to find a way to push the government to respond to those requests in a way um, that is smart uh, and that's also compassionate, compassionate to animals and compassionate to workers. Uh, so what, what ultimately needs to happen, I think, is that um, as we see federal funds being committed, you know, it seems like every day there's a new funding announcement. Uh, what we need to see is, is to, to see those dollars going towards uh, programs and policies that will put us on track to the future that we want. Um, and in the agriculture industry, I think that future is a sustainable, resilient uh, industry that's safe um, and, you know, enables Canadians to access the plant-based foods that will sustain our health and also uh, the climate. So certainly that's that's been our main focus, especially, you know, in the last week, because as I said, things are, are changing quite rapidly. It's a different situation every day. And, and you, you can visit our website. If you go to the media releases section, you'll see that we have called on the federal government not to provide bailout funding to factory farms that abuse animals and instead prioritize what Caitlin is talking about, which is the plant-based industry, which is much more resilient, better for us, better for the planet, better for animals. And there's quite a comprehensive letter there that you can read. And if you have a meeting with a politician or you want to get in touch with them, you could use that letter as a basis for it. Uh, we'll also have some action pages out later this week and hopefully next week to um, help you get in touch with politicians and remind them that our bailout tax taxpayers money should go towards the right thing. Um, another person has commented that the, the relevancy of uh, with the relevancy of COVID-19, it's a good time to bring up to our MLAs and MPs to discuss the relationship between agriculture and deadly pathogens. And I think that's absolutely an excellent point. We should definitely be doing that. Um, I can tell you that all the animal protection groups in the country right now are talking about this and about collaborating and how we can drive that issue to the forefront of conversation when the time is right. Because I think what we can't accept is going back to the status quo after this pandemic because the status quo was not working. Mm -hmm. um, another person comments that they love that we teach people to take action by building relationships and the welfare, the animal welfare need, community needs to do this more often. I totally agree. I hope everyone listening agrees with that. Um, and I forgot to mention that the, the name of the special modules that we're launching in the fall is going to be the Animal Justice Academy. And it's uh, in progress right now. It's headed up by a wonderful colleague. It's going to be really good. Um, someone asked what egg gag is and spelled it egg, E-G-G, -G, E-G-G. -G -G. And it's, I know it's a little bit hard to, to get the spelling from when we're talking, but uh, if you're still listening, that, that person who asked the question, egg gag laws are the laws that would make it an offense for whistleblowers to expose factory farms or, or any farms or agriculture or slaughterhouses for animal cruelty or other problems. And the, the, the name itself comes uh, from a longer title, which would be agricultural gag, um, which means, you know, gagging agricultural whistleblowers. So that's why it's, it's egg gag, egg, A-G, although now in hindsight, I can see why it sounds like egg gag, which I've never thought about before. <laughs> Yeah, and I just I just have a quick update from um, our, our communications manager, Shannon, who says we're now at $8,677 toward our $10,000 goal. So I'm totally confident we can reach this by the end of the day. If you've enjoyed this session, we're going to answer a few more questions, but you're totally welcome to donate. We would be so grateful and your donation will be doubled today by a very generous donor. So this will go a long way to making sure that we can um, help create a more sustainable, less cruel future. Um, just looking through a couple of the other questions. Um, yeah, somebody did bring up the fact that municipalities might have bylaws uh, that can that can 
protect animals depending on the jurisdiction. That's totally right. And um, I'm just scrolling here. Someone asks, what was the report that the Globe and Mail did? It was an article on the Saturday Globe and Mail by several investigative reporters, and it looked at the slaughterhouse situation in Alberta and how the workers are experiencing that. Um, very, very disturbing information about the conditions that they've been forced to endure going into work, the fact that so many of them got sick, and uh, the fact that the slaughterhouses apparently sat on their hands for far too long before taking action. So if you visit the Globe and Mail's website, I think you can probably find it by doing a little searching around. It was um, a pretty big piece on Saturday. Um, Jordan Veg Food announced that they've started a monthly donation today, which just warms my heart. Thank, Thank you, you, Jordan, that's amazing. <laughs> We're so grateful. We're so grateful. Um, and I think that's most of the question. Oh, someone asks, are most workers in these factory farms or slaughterhouses refugees or other newly immigrated people? Um, that's a great question. Oftentimes they are. Um, we, I, I don't know the exact breakdown, but we've heard that in the Alberta slaughterhouses, and I think, I think I'm talking about the High River slaughterhouse, there's a large number of Filipino workers who've come over um, searching for better opportunities and are working there. there. Um, slaughterhouses tend to employ people on the margins who don't have many other opportunities. That can often be immigrants, um, that can often be temporary foreign workers. A number of temporary foreign workers work in slaughterhouses. But the uh, common thread is that they're people who often are marginalized. They may not speak English very well. And so if they see notices on a community board inside the slaughterhouse advising of safety precautions in English, and that's not their first language, they may be at a disadvantage because they can't adequately absorb that information. So there's a lot of problems there, but um, it's, it's absolutely true that people in these industries tend not to have a lot of other options. Uh, okay, wow, so many comments and questions. I'm so grateful. I wasn't sure if anybody was going to comment, but a whole bunch of you um, did. And now I think that we've gotten through most of these. So I just want to again thank you all, remind you that we're just over a thousand dollars away from reaching our goal of ten thousand dollars today and that your donation will be doubled. It was really amazing to engage with all of you today. Uh, I think this went really, really well. We're, we're so grateful. Maybe we'll do another one. Um, but I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope it gave you a little bit of hope. I hope that you're all staying safe right now and that you're healthy and that um, you're continuing to think about the animals. I know you are because you're here today. Uh, that's why we are all here. It's because animal suffering doesn't stop during a pandemic and neither do we. So thank you, Caitlin, for joining me. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Aisha. This has been great. And most of all, thanks to everyone for tuning in. If you're not already on our mailing list, you can join it at animaljustice.ca and you'll stay uh, apprised of actions that we're taking to combat this pandemic and combat animal cruelty. So please check it out. For now, I guess we're signing off and we hope to see you again soon. Now I have to figure out how to end it. Oh, here we go. Okay, bye.